from the creators who brought you RuPaul's Drag Race and Million Dollar Listing. This is World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of the Wow Report. I'm Fenton Bailey, co-founder of World of Wonder, joined by my partners in crime, Tom Campbell, our chief creative officer. Hello, hello, hello. And James St. James, editor of the Wow Report. That's me. That's the blog. And we are doing what we normally do at this time of the week, counting down the top 10 things of the last seven days that made us go, wow. wow. Starting at number 10, Tom. Number 10. I was really looking forward to this one. It's a new show on Hulu by Steve Levitan, who is the creator of Modern Family. He also did Wings back in the day and Just Shoot Me. And it is the new comedy reboot. Oh. You guys, have you heard about it? Have you seen the posters? Anything? I've seen a poster, but tell me, but give, give, us the, give us the plot. It's the behind the scenes of the reboot of like a 90s sitcom. So same cast. 15 years later, the timeline's weird because it's supposed to be like 2005. Um, and it's it's all about, it was sort of inspired by, very loosely, the Roseanne reboot. Uh, because when he was doing Modern Family, he thought like in the front face, here's this incredible idea. And then, you know, all the shenanigans and stuff that must have been going on behind the thing. Now, it's got, and again, Steve Levitan's a great writer. Um, Rachel Bloom plays the showrunner. The incredible Judy Greer plays the female, you know, sitcom star. Johnny Knoxville plays her husband. Keegan Michael Key plays. I, I, well, he's in the sitcom okay, as well. A, a fantastic cast so far. I'm loving yes. that. Yeah. And Paul Reiser is. Uh, this is gonna be the spoiler alert, and people get upset about spoiler alerts. We're saying spoiler alert, so jump ahead. Which is what you find out very quickly is that it's also meta because it's being made for Hulu and it appears on Hulu. So there's lots of inside jokes about streaming and television, la la la. And Rachel Bloom wants to take this very cheesy, funny sitcom and reboot it, but make it really more, more like sad and how things no, don't work out for them. And then all of a sudden, right before they're about to do their first table read, the network calls the network executive calls her who's never done anything in comedy before and 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 the in comes a new showrunner and it's the original showrunner who's Paul Reiser who plays a hacky old sitcom guy and then it turns out this is another spoiler alert is that Rachel Bloom is his daughter so Paul Reiser's estranged daughter is Rachel Bloom so it's generational it's it's about you know uh, them repairing their relationship it's about Keegan Michael Key used to have a relationship with Judy Greer, so they're dealing with that. And there is um, another fun. There's a character who plays like the kid who's all grown up that nobody thinks is very interesting, and they ignore him. They have no like parental um, parental uh, abilities in them. And his mother ends up being like a cougar and has sex with one of the people on the cast. So because she still like follows him around, I, I was looking forward to it, which is always a mistake because you come with high, high, high expectations, and it. It creaks forward a little bit. There's some really laugh out loud points. It feels really inside and I'm inside, so that's okay. And then sometimes I don't know what it's statement's trying to make and that's okay, but is it like, is it comedy versus dramedy and dramedy is bad and comedy is good? At one point, uh, Paul Reiser brings back these really old, like, you know, Rosemary uh, <laughs> kind of writers in the room. Um, <laughs> And so there's a bunch of back and forth and they're starting to get along. I see it's turning into something better and evolved. I didn't do a great job of describing it, but it's really, it's getting pretty good reviews. There's one bad review and a lot of good reviews. Um, uh, it's trying to do a lot, but then again, there's a lot of, and it also, this is my own prejudice, but it reminds me of Modern Family, which for years I loved. I, it, would, it would make me swell up and feel warm at the end. And this one, is like that, but not as good. And we'll see. We'll but see Modern it. Family took a few seasons before you really, you know, before they became part of your family too. So you might have to, it might be one of those things that just gets better and better, you know, you don't, you don't right. know. So just, I, I just, it's out there in the world. It's definitely something worth checking out. Um, it's very different, but it reminds me a little bit of that. Uh, I love this for you, which is about behind the scenes of QVC on Showtime. Which sounds also a little bit like the comeback, sort of. Where yeah. it's like I thought like it's gonna be the comeback with Stephen Levitan doing it, 
which is a great yeah. combination. It's just there's a lot of mechanics and sort of pipe to lay down, but we'll see. And I, I'm going to watch more. So I'd love to know how these shows get commissioned, because the one thing you always hear in Hollywood is like, oh, it's too insidery and no one yes. ever wants insidery. And yet so every so often, too, too insufficiently often, I'd say, you get these meta type shows. So how is it that they get through that net of like, no? I guess no. it's Steve Levitan, Modern Family. I made ABC $100 billion. There you go. There you go. Hold yeah. on. I have to go um, yell at my neighbors real quickly because they're being very loud. And I have to tell them to shut their door because it's right there. So hold on one sec. I love um, this. this is great having... radio. Let's sit in silence as James gets up from his library seat. Is at home. By the way, Fenton and I are back in the office. For those of you watching, we're we not are back in the office, but we're still socially distanced, like we're we on are. different floors. The, the truth is that none of us want to sit at the table again because we've all gained so much weight. No one wants to sit on the side. And I refuse. But also, to there's no sitting at that table and being socially distanced. You are literally <laughs> inhaling each other's CO2, right? But yes. I'm ready for it, Tom. I feel like I've had every every possible disease from the pandemic at this point so i'm ready i'm ready to breathe all over you and for you and to breathe talk, all over what are we talking me. about what did i miss we're talking about getting back together reuniting and doing the show no, hell no hell no 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 wow that's never gonna happen ever 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 <laughs> well james we are about to <laughs> announce a return to the office policy and it'd be interesting to see how you deal with that Yes. Well, I have been going to the office four days a week until you started reading your book and and displaced me. So don't tell me about going to the office when I'm there every damn day. And just oh, for our I'm... listeners, we are, we are looking for the role of James St. James. I'm going to play the role of James St. James in the WOW Report starting when we all come back to <laughs> All right. That, that is Reboot streaming on Hulu. New episodes every Tuesday. Number nine, James. Number nine. I have been on a Hulu binge myself, and I need to start off by saying I listened to Tom. I took Tom's advice. I watched uh, Only Murders in the Building starting episode one, scene one, and binged all the way. I'm halfway through season two. I've got to say you are absolutely right. I love every <laughs> second of it. It is absolutely genius. The characters are just so wonderful. The writing is so crisp. Everything about it, it, that building, everything, clothes, everything. I love it. I love it. I love it. You are absolutely correct. I will never doubt you again. But now, the number two thing that I watched on Hulu this week is The Bear. Do you guys know about The Bear? Yeah, we watched The Bear. Yes. Okay. I tried to watch The Bear and it was too intense for me. So tell me about it. Well, that's just it. It, it builds itself as a dramedy. It's like a comedy drama. The only reason it's funny is if you happen to think that stressed out screaming chefs, you know, who are who are trying to attack each other. If you think that's funny, then go ahead and watch this. It is edge of your seat. It is so upsetting. It is just it the the the, the, the plot is is this five star chef from you know one of the best restaurants in the world comes back to his hometown and takes over his father's sandwich shop after the father passes away. And it's just this sort of hole in the wall and he's trying to make it better. And of course, everyone's fighting him and all, all the restaurant workers all hate each other and blah, blah, and are all against him, blah, 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 blah. But the good thing about it is that it's Jeremy Allen White, who was lip on Shameless. I don't know if you guys watch Shameless, but- I know you did. I know you did. Uh, yeah. And it's basically the same character. It's a dirtbag genius surrounded by other dirtbags because Lip was like an MIT genius and his family was all dirtbags. And so he was sort of like a fish. And this is the same thing where he's this great, great chef and he's surrounded by blah, 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 blah. But the thing about him is, and the internet on social media, they keep calling him the working girls, Timothy Chalamet. <laughs> because he's this like, sort of like he's got this sort of dirtbag working class middle American look. He looks look unwashed. About him. He looks his hair is greasy. He looks unwashed, but that sort he looks like he smells. But that's sort of the appeal. He's got onion armpits. You can sort of tell. But he's got these lovely, big, sad eyes that are just so wise, and he just looks like he's just he's seen a lot. He looks like he's been through a war, and I just love him so Which much. Which episode he, are you on? 
I'm on episode five. Oh, wow. Because you made it through. Because I couldn't get past the first two. I was like. The the, the thing is about that. The cousin is so upsetting because the cousin is such an asshole and is riding his dick so hard. And it's just being so nasty. And it's hard to watch because it's just so relentlessly nasty. But Mm -hmm. you do sort of learn to, to soften towards the cousin a little bit because he's got problems and he's dealing with shit on his own. And they give him some backstory. So it's not quite so out of the blue evil, but I'm, I'm going to keep doing it. I'm going to keep going with it because I find Jeremy um, just uh, a really watchable, watchable you know, star. This isn't, this is like the third time we've reviewed the bear on this show. I don't know. No, like, it is. Yes, yes, who has done it? Yeah. Tom Gamble did it. Yeah, I, I didn't because I, I barely I barely could barely. Win. And wait, what was, what did you walk away from it thinking? Fenton? Well, maybe, it him, I, I mean, maybe it was Seth. I like I maybe. just know we've had we talked about oh, the bear. Maybe it was the bear. People yeah. that I totally Blake says it was Seth. People I respect deeply who are great people and great writers and great taste love that show. I, yeah. I, I well, I'll tell I'll tell you what it reminds me a little bit of your Ted Lasso yesterday where or last week when you were saying. That like it's this really you you really get to know the characters and the writing is so good and everything like that. And I kept thinking, I don't care about you know football in the Midwest. I don't care about sous chefs in Chicago, but somehow I'm I'm drawn into this. And I think good writing is good writing and it'll make you care about things. And and Tom, you're in good favor with James this week. This is amazing. You You are the golden boy. You are the gold. If only this was on tape. Oh, it is. (laughs) <laughs> this can only mean one thing. It's going to be bad news for me. So I am. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody needs to get James Rath, and it's round not and know. round we go. Where I stop, <laughs> nobody knows. Well, here we go. Number eight. Number eight. God save the queue. I got up at two forty-five in the morning on uh, September twentieth to watch the funeral. Or was it the nineteenth? I forget which day it was. It was very early in the morning and I watched the funeral. The funeral of Queen Elizabeth, James. Yes, yeah, of course. Hoping yeah. the bear, hoping for a reaction here. No, 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 and, I watched it too. I was up watching it too. What did you think? Well, I, you know, I loved every single moment of Megan. I think she looked spectacular. I thought she acted spectacular. I thought her and Harry were just the, the epitome of class. I enjoyed every second of that. I also love Princess Anne in a way that I have never loved her. Good before. moment for Princess Anne. Yes, she's yeah, going to she be the really rose to the occasion. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, so. And as you probably know, before the funeral, the queen was lying in state. And in this moment of bonkers, of, of, of something that only would happen in England, a queue formed that ran almost through the entirety of the city of London for, I think at one point, it was something like nine miles long. 17 and, hours, 23 hours. Yeah, some people embraced that very idea. And there was this... Um, Someone wrote a piece on Twitter that went viral about how this queue is the triumph of Britishness and that British people love a queue and and that you know you cannot well, leave. It is the one queue. of those things like um like a hurric- like when a hurricane happens and the lights go out and neighbors find neighbors and everybody yes. like oh, meets we love everybody. That. Yeah, yeah, and everybody just sort of comes together and talks like they never talk usually. It was like yeah. the war. It was like the war yes. all over again. That it was that. like the Blitz. Yes. The blitz. Well, trending on Twitter was David Beckham because he was in that queue. Yeah, he, he, was in- he, he could have jumped the line, and yet he wanted to be one of the ordinary people experiencing. Mm-hmm. My my favorite thing about it. Hold on, and then I'll let you. I'll let you go right there. But. You, there was a real generational divide when the camera was on the the queen on the on the coffin, and you would see older people bow and curtsy more than the and you'd see little girls curtsy, but there was like a real you there was like fifty and up curtsied and bowed and everybody else didn't and I thought it was very sweet. I got tears in my eyes a number of times when I'd see the little old ladies bow down. It was so you of course were watching the live stream which was carried on the BBC. So the BBC and the BBC was a sort of teased for becoming Mourn Hub, rebranded as Mourn Hub. Um because because they really did have to for example um Drag Race UK premieres this week and we had to cease all promotion of the series. Um, I was watching Ken Burns 
documentary about the Holocaust, which is incredible right. and painful. No, and, and, no, that's mine. I'm talking about that next. I know, but I fell asleep while I was watching it. Yeah. And when I woke up in the middle of the night, it was BBC on PBS right. and the Queen's funeral. So I had it on the whole time, sort of in and out of my sleep. You slept all the way I, through it, yeah. And when I was finally awake, they were at Windsor Castle. And, you know, last year when we shot Drag Race, which was about to come out, we I was we looking shot. for your apartment. I was like, where's Tom's window? We were literally right next to the castle, and that was our home stomping ground. And that incredible promenade, or everyone to say it, that, that two-mile-long path that uh, Raven and Theron would walk if, every day to get their steps in. If what only she day. had died six months earlier, you would have had been right there. You would have it was spectacular. Place. And it made me think of my favorite restaurant, The Real Greek, which is right around the corner. But, yeah. um, but you know, uh, one thing I will was, say is, as, as great as the funeral was, I actually found... I think the queue actually sort of touched me more than the funeral, as did the the the, the watching the queen's coffin uh, being carried from one place yeah. to the other. I just thought that was fascinating watching, and I I kind of kicked myself because I wish we'd done what the New Yorker did, which was they they got a camera crew out there and they made a documentary about the queue, and of course, a genius. It's just yeah. sitting right there, amazing content, amazing moment in history, and. Um, what a great thing, you know? You do see um, there is a certain withdrawal, especially among British media right now, like in the Daily Mail and stuff. It's like, they it, it was like literally every single, you know, item was something, you know, funeral related. And now they're like, what do we talk about? And it's all like, you know, what's next for King Charles? Oh, what's next for Camilla? Like, it's, there's a it's a, the, Daily Mail, <laughs> the Daily Mail has a body language expert who's always like, Examining the body language of, of Megan and Harry language, and saying, it, it, you know. it was Prince Harry and Megan, and it was like they're too close. They shouldn't be holding hands. And right. then the next day, it was like they aren't touching. What's the matter with them? Is there a problem in paradise? Like they could uh, nothing. They did. It's like it's like she's crying. She's not crying. Like right. whatever Megan does is wrong. She is an actress, you know. She is an actress. <laughs> and every time they refer to the body expert, you know, they're just making it up. They're just sitting like tap 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 tap. It's like we I could be body you. experts. Yeah, body experts. Okay, let's go to the break. Wait, no, no, but but uh, wait, just one last thing. There was also I kept seeing you know when they would talk about the scepter and the crown and how many diamonds were in the crown and they oh. would show it, blah blah blah. And I kept thinking somebody's gonna make a break for it. Somebody is gonna try and get. It. And by God, someone did. Right as I was thinking it, someone made a, a leap for the crown and oh. was taken down by the police. Did you see that? I did not see that. Yeah, did some you... guy broke out of the queue and ran up to the casket to try and grab the crown. It was actually quite firmly attached but yeah. speaking of did you see the spider the spider oh, on the bouquet that, that was the other thing because people were saying you know puerto rico is underwater you know trump is going down and yet all the news talks about is the damn spider walking across the casket and the, the spider got its own twitter account it's so cute <laughs> We'll post some uh, of the stills on. on love that. the Brits. God bless the Brits. <laughs> and in good news, as we go to break, I just want to tell you that RuPaul's, RuPaul's Drag Race UK Series 4 is now airing. Um, we didn't mercifully have to delay the start date. We just weren't allowed to promote it at all. But you can see it on Wapresents Plus um, in the US and around the world, apart from the UK, where it's on BBC. We're back in the office. I've been talking to some people that have been watching previews and they're saying this is like one of the best UK seasons ever. Just, you know. There you go. Blake, you got a question for us? I do, I do. Um, now, you probably know this and maybe you do too, James, since you've been watching wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the Queen. Um, but formerly George, Charlotte, and Lewis, their last name was Cambridge. Do you know what their last name is now that the queen has passed on? And yeah, James knows. Oh, mm -mm. well, look. Okay, we'll go. We'll go have our break and be right back after the break. Listen to the Wow Report on Radio Andy. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report on Radio Andy. It's Fenton here with Tom and James and Blake. Hi. Um, yeah, I asked George, Charlotte, and Lewis used to be the Cambridges. These are Prince William and Kate's kids. What is their new last name? Well, now they're Windsors, of course. 
They moved to Windsor, so I'm gonna say Windsor. Well, they be no, he be, it's, it's the Duke of Cambridge, and the and then he'll be the Duke of Windsor. Well, no, he's the Prince of Wales. Or the Duke of Wales, maybe it's the Prince, Wales is. Sweetie, it's, Prince, it's, Prince, it's, Prince. Yeah, they're of gonna, Wales. yeah, it's, he's gonna be the Duke of Wales now. I mean, the Prince of Wales. Prince of yes, Wales. Their last name is now Wells. And what was what was Elizabeth? Well, she was Windsor, right? No, well, she was well, she was Mountbatten, and they and then it was Windsor. Oh, right. Yeah. It was Sax von Sax Sax von Goethe, and they um decided it, after World War One that that was too um. Well, German. Mountbatten's still pretty German. Sax von Goethe, I hardly know. Her. <laughs> oh my! Just to do that. <laughs> All right, here we are on Radio Andy doing what we love to do, which is counting down the top ten things of the week that made us go, "Wow!" And we've reached number seven. Number seven. There's a documentary that I think already aired in the UK, but was just premiering in the US on Turner Classic Movies called This Is Joan Collins. <gasps> it's all about Joan Collins. It's narrated by Joan Collins. I feel like I spent the evening last night with Joan Collins. I watched it. I feel I like I spent a lifetime with Joan Collins last night. Did, did you watch? I did, I did. <laughs> um, I don't know what, I mean, and, and there may have been more objective documentaries, more expensive <laughs> documentaries, but there is something, she is wickedly smart, wickedly yeah, yeah. clever, sharp as a tack. I think she's yes. 88 now. And she's, you know, she's Jane almost Collins 90. Is, she's eight. I was doing the math last night. She's, she's 87, I think 86 yeah. or 87. She's up there. Sharp as a tack looks amazing. At one point, you know, they have sort of a behind the scenes stuff and she, and they're all like, you look great. You look great. They're setting up the shot. And she goes, I look great in real life. So I should look even better on tele. Like put some <laughs> lights on me, bitch. You know, she was very like, <laughs> and at one point she's like, I'm going to put, cause she's read from a scrapbook. She's like, I'm going to put the scrapbook here. She's just doing, you know, that thing that where she takes over and she's like, listen, I'm getting stiff. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. But she was fantastic. And what a life. And what, oh my what a God. beauty, what a beauty. Okay, okay, For, we, we have to talk about the beauty. I mean, there's just, there's no getting around how absolutely gorgeous she was in the 50s and early 60s, in her starlet era. You break it down into four eras with Joan. There's the starlet era, there's the late 60s, 70s, washed up has been, where she's doing wagon train and she's doing them with the air. Star the Trek, one of the she's most doing popular Star, yeah, Star Trek. She's doing the ant movie. She's doing the stud in the bitch, which yes. she tried to set off and tell us was the biggest selling movie in history. But they, but at the time, I recall that was porn. That was, that was. That was I, was first, I was first introduced to Joan Collins on the Mike Dallas show when she was talking, when she was trying to talk her way out of, because the stud and whatever the other one was, the they bitch. were such, yeah, the bitch, but they were so, like, in a good way. It was scandalous. scandalous. Yes. It was scandalous. Yes. I remember my mother was horrified that it was on HBO and that we could say, uh, yeah, I mean, it was not a prestige move for her, but she was trying to sell it this way than it was for her. But yeah. Okay. So uh, the third age of John uh, Collins is. The third, then, then there's the dynasty era, of course. Oh. Of Yes, and that's really fun. And then the fourth is her post dynasty, where she's writing her books and trying to be Jackie and marrying Percy. I Can thought... I just interject in the fourth era? Randy and I saw Joan Collins maybe 10, 15, maybe 20 years ago on the West End. She was in Blythe Spirit. Oh. And apropos of nothing, in the middle of the play, she did the splits on stage. <laughs> no, no card play ever requires an actor or an actress to do the splits. It's just not what he there does. There was a picture she pulled up of her grandmother who supported her and her showbiz oh, career. Yeah. And, she was, and she was in the splits. And Joan said, and she taught me to do the splits. Um, I don't know if James, you remember. I didn't take away any ego from her. I thought... She has ego in her persona, but I felt like she was very, she started off by saying, I, I want you to see, you know, what it's really like, you know, to be in an entertainment and what it's like when you get everything you want. But in, other, in other words, like, be careful what you wish for. Well, well, and she has had enough trauma in her relationships for her to to not be phony. I mean, she's yes. there's nothing not a phony bone in her body. She's also has that Charo Zsa Zsa Gabor Dolly Parton thing where she knows the lines, she knows the the Absolutely. how to turn it on and it's, off. Yeah. And, and the last she's, she's she, spectacular you know, she, at it. She, she was married a lot of bad marriages. Anthony Newley was very bad to her, and her then first she had marriage in which. 
she was 17 and was raped on her wedding night. I mean, she's just yeah, been, so, she really know, back then it was just one of those things. She goes, now we call it date rape, you know, so she's lived through and, and, and the, 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 she's very, and she considers herself a feminist and calls herself a feminist, but she's also like all survivors. She's like, let's move on. Let's move on. There's ego in her performance, but not in her. She knows how to put Joan Collins on. It's, yeah, it's, a, it's right. a character that she can Which turn on and off. always what was so delicious about Alexis in Dynasty. Because it was all just preening ego, darling. Well, and there's even what a the point th where she was being, uh, she was brought to court by Tandem House or something because they gave her a huge, a huge uh, forward for like books and they thought she hadn't fulfilled and she did. And she went the first day and they just ripped it to pieces. So she, they showed her the film of the second day and she's like, I decided to bring Alexis into court with me. And so she just, just turned on Alexis Carrington and she wins the whole settlement and then the money goes away. <laughs> one of the great things, one of the most fun things is watching the fashions evolve you know, from the 50s to the 60s to the 70s. And then by the time it gets to Dynasty era and she's in the Nolan Miller every night of her life and the mm. Bob Mackies, that era is just, she's so fantastic to watch. All oh, Every oh, outfit yeah. was just so delicious. I am she lived through the Blitzkrieg, so it's from World War II till now is really the story of, of, of yeah. Joe Collins, which is kind of Filled with anxiety that she's going to die. I mean, it's going to be like losing the queen. It, it will. It'll be like losing Elizabeth Taylor. It will be that right. that we will feel it as much. All right. Oh, what is that streaming on? Why can I see it, Tom? It was on Turner it? Classic Movies where I saw it, and I think you can also get it like on BritBox on Amazon. Right. It's like okay. it's also on BBC. Uh, this is Jim Collins streaming everywhere, darling. Um, number six. Number six. I watched the Quantum Leap reboot that's on NBC that started this week, starring a guy, a hot young Asian actor named Raymond Lee, who is doing the Scott Bakula role. And he's he is really he, he's not quite there. I mean, it's only the first episode, but um, uh, he's got charisma and he's really cute and I'm liking him a lot. And that's all I need really to watch the show. Once again, he's lost in the t quantum leap accelerator and every week he jumps into a new body and he has to do a good deed before he can jump out of that body into the next body. And that's the next week. And every single week it's, you know, he's in a different time. He's, he's at the JFK assassination. He's at the, you know, nine 11. He's, you know, that, he's a woman truck driver. You're know, like, you, you never know what he's going to be uh, from week to week. His fiance is a hologram who it travels with him and gives him advice on how to deal with everything blah, blah, blah. but nobody can see her and he can't touch her and he doesn't know he doesn't remember her because he's he's lost all his memories blah, blah 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 one of the interesting things is there is a team of scientists that are trying to bring him back in 2022 and leading the team is an actor named mason alexander paul who is a non-binary stage actor uh, they are famous for, well, they're on the Sandman right now. They play the trans goddess Desire. Um, they are also uh, famous for their Pulitzer Prize winning play, I Am Not My Wife. I don't know if you remember that a few years ago. I think it was on the West End. They've also done Hedwig and they toured as Mary Poppins in England, I think. Rocky Horror on the West End. So they're they're interesting but I don't like them. There's something abrasive about them that I, I think it's an interesting, bold choice. I like it. And I remember that all the casting is interesting on this. And I remember last year when we were talking about Kung Fu and I was saying why, you know, yes, it's great to have an Asian show, but why does it always have to be martial arts? And this is something that is just casts an Asian character and he's hot and everyone is in love with them and blah, blah, blah. And I like this a little better than something like Kung Fu, which is full of tropes. And I like the casting of just this non-binary person as the head of the labs. I think it's I think it's great, and it's it's very twenty twenty two. Remind me with uh, Quantum Leap because I used to watch the old one. When he is a female truck driver, he still looks like himself, but everybody else well, sees him as he, a truck driver. When he when he's acting, he looks like himself, but when he looks in the mirror, he can see what the what what the, what the person looks like. Okay. Hmm. So that's uh, Quantum Leap. Where where can we find it on Peacock? Right, uh, it's on Peacock and NBC. It's on, it's on the it's a network show. All right, moving on. Number five. Number five. Encyclopedia Madonica. Uh, Matthew Rettenmund, 
uh, first wrote this book in 1995. It's been reissued and updated a couple of times by him since. And now there is a brand spanking new edition of Encyclopedia Madonica from Matthew Rettemond, who is, you may also know, as the creator of Boy Culture, uh, both the original film and the recent series. So, and the blog, the blog Boy Culture. Well, which of is course, my blog, how can I give out the blog? Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's Matthew. Matthew, we're very excited to welcome you to the WOW Report to talk about the 2022 edition of Encyclopedia Madonna. Oh, oh. oh my gosh. It's gorgeous. Cover. Thank you. Oh my God. It's so big and thick. That's the way <laughs> it should be. That's, that's a very Madonna line, isn't it? <laughs> well, a reason I just had to get you on the show was because you wrote... I think the best two word description of Madonna that has ever been written in your interview recently, which was to say that she is unuser friendly. User unfriendly, <laughs> yes, user you unfriendly. See, I even fucked it up. I even fucked it up. It's two words and I fucked it up. <laughs> user unfriendly, yes. Can you elaborate on that? Well, I think as a long time kind of Madonna watcher, it's it's become obvious to me that she's She's just that kind of person who she, she, she wants to be loved, but she doesn't want you to think she wants to be loved, but she's not going to go out of her way. And, well, I, and I just feel that that's what, has, that's what has made her so controversial for so long is that she has no real uh, reserves of goodwill because she's, she's just as happy to thumb her nose. Always has been, right? But is it that she, so. wa she would rather be adored than loved is what I always sort of think? I think she wants... I think she wants to be loved, but I think she gets comfortable in it. And then she wants to shrug it off and challenge you. She wants to keep challenging people. I, whenever she kind of goes on a run where she's just kind of doing well and everybody likes her and it's kind of cool to like her again, she wants to spoil it as, as soon yeah. as possible. So where are we then in the Madonna cycle? At what point are we at right now? Right now, I think she's, she's reality testing again. Um, they're trying to get her to do sort of um, legacy stuff. And, you know, to, to re, you know, re-entrench like with her entire career because she's got this greatest hits package that's out and she's got she's had 40 years in the industry. So she's supposed to be taking a victory lap. And instead of taking a victory lap, I feel like she's kind of just absolutely, you know, sowing her oats and running around and she's out every night and making videos with Tokisha and just doing whatever she can to sort of shake things up and, and be the opposite of what people would expect. You know, some people say, would say, well, that's what we expect. I what? expect we owe Madonna nothing. We she gave, she's given us everything year after year, song after song. We were talking on the show the other week how that greatest hits remix package. At first, I thought it was gonna be a lot of collabs, but then you just go through the list and it's just it's remarkable how many of the songs, even some of the quote unquote forgotten songs or less played songs, are just incredible. Ah, there's like not, not not a B side in the whole list. They're all like number ones, as I guess is the whole point. But this is it's like she has nothing. She has nothing left to prove. But I feel like she every day she wakes up and acts like she does. That's how yeah. I, I feel like she she never wants to rest on her laurels, and so I find that really admirable. Even when it can be very challenging as a fan, like when she does stuff, you're like, "Why are you doing this? I want you to do this." But that's what part of the fun of it is because she's she's not one of these divas that just kind of sits back and um you know signs autographs well, you know i had always thought that she was going to go like the barbara Streisand thing and do like a gershwin song book or a broadway song book whatever. and she just won't she's going to be eight ninety years old and still pumping out dubstep i mean she just will mm -hmm. not or ever whatever. settle down exactly whatever is popular that, when she's 90 she'll about be her now. exploring that yeah and I, she, I did it, Sondheim. she did sondheim and she's done andrew lloyd webber <laughs> but she did. I mean, she. But I want her to do the whole American song. But I want her I to go it. like. I want her to look like Jackie O and act like Barbara Streisand, and it's never going to happen <laughs> ever. ever, ever. <laughs> My copy is 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 in the post. I hope Matthew better be in the post. It is. Um, but one of the entries uh, I saw written about was under the entry "Irrelevant." You write, "People do not argue over the relevance of artists who are not relevant." 
It's absolutely yeah. true. It's like, and, yeah. and and how, how many days have you even gone by over the last 20 years when we haven't had a fight about whether Madonna is relevant? <laughs> it's like the topic that won't go away. Whoever it's was true. the first person to write that article, they really set that off forever. <laughs> um, yeah, it's true. I mean, she's she's endlessly relevant. And whether you like or don't like what's happening in that any given moment, you look at the Daily Mail, all these, you know, all these tabloids every day. It's she posts something, it can be the most innocuous thing. It becomes it becomes a feature. And then people go 100%. and they rail about it and they say, I love her, I hate her, she's old, she's annoying, I love this. And I guess that's really the key to being relevant in in today's age. I mean, for me, it's hard because I wouldn't want to be that kind of relevant. I'd be I'd be sad if I was reading all these negative comments constantly. Yeah. But I think yeah. Madonna has correctly intuited that this is what it is now. And she's well, plugged herself into that and she's not looking back. Do you have a that. favorite Madonna era? Do you have something that one that just you is closer to your heart than any of the others? I mean, you can't you really can't get better than Boy Toy and Blonde Ambition. I mean, those are just I mean, those are just yeah. absolute classics. And that those hit me when I was young. So I'm obsessed in particular with Desperately Seeking Susan, the film. And so I mm. love that era of Madonna. But I like just I like when she just is completely different and kind of unexpected. I never would have seen Ray of Light coming. I never would have thought I would have liked Ray of Light. It didn't seem like my kind of thing. And when she was you was, saw her in the cowboy hat, you were like, What? Madonna in a cowboy hat? What the hell is going on? Yes. I cannot work. wait for the movie, the Madonna movie written by <laughs> Madonna, starring Madonna, about Madonna. I mean, it looks like it will star Madonna because it doesn't seem like anyone wants to be in it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny? I think it should be one of those things where the credits are literally say that. Madonna. Written by, well, and starring, you know, we know, like little, little rascals. We know that, we know that there's the, the technology now that can make her look 14 again. So I don't know. I, I, I'm certain she could do it. I well, I thought... Oh, go Sorry. ahead. I was going to say, I just want quickly want to say, I had heard at one point early on that she wanted to do sort of um, that Bob Dylan thing where she had different people playing her throughout oh, the movie, all different yeah. ages, races, genders. Could have been interesting because then you wouldn't have to worry about getting Julia Garner to say yes. Right. A question. <laughs> did, did RuPaul's Drag Race, Madonna, the unauthorized musical, make it anywhere in your book? Yes, of course. <laughs> in that and case second, second i want to just put on my qvc sales hat for a minute and just say you need to buy several volumes of this right because you should buy two for yourself one to immediately read and one to keep wrapped for posterity and then you should have at least one if not more around for gifts and i was gonna say it's, it's the perfect hostess gift for all the holiday parties coming it's, up it really you know is. why i think it makes a good gift is like whether the person is a huge madonna fan or just a casual fan it's it's sort of like a, a little a Warholian thing to have this gigantic encyclopedia, it's absurd, devoted to any one person, let alone Madonna, on your coffee table. So well, I was, I it, know it looks now. so good on a coffee table that it I just, know what it, I'm what giving is Madonna. James, I know what I'm giving James and James for Christmas and <laughs> and Tom Campbell. And I, 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 I swear to God, I have a '90s copy around here somewhere. I do, I do. Oh, that one is so analog. It looks like a zine. My yeah. first one that was I thought it was so cool. It was it looks Xerox, it truly does. It's like my comrade. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Matthew, congratulations. I wish you many weeks at the top of the New York Times bestseller list. I'm sure it's gonna happen. And maybe you and, can sell, sell the movie rights. I love that. And boy culture, the series is coming, coming soon. Coming soon, yes. Congratulations on that. Anytime. Come Julia back. Garner will be in that one too. <laughs> <laughs> She's that talented. All right, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with more on the Wow Report on Radio Andy. Yay, oh my God. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report. It's Fenton here with James and Tom and Blake. Counting down our countdown, we've reached number four, I think, right? Yes, we have. Number four. Number four. Guys, this article about Eric Adam, or the Dave, meteorologist. He's the New York One meteorologist who was just recently fired. He's very handsome, young, yeah. happens to be homosexual, who was fired because on some website he performed sexual acts for other men 
in a, in a consensual way. Somebody found the images, shared them with his boss. He was put on suspension and then he was fired. And he's been very apologetic. I would read him to you, but he's, been, he's like, you know, I had a great responsibility. I'm sorry for anyone I hurt or upset or embarrassed. Who but, do you upset or hurt or embarrass by having well, sex? But, but, wait, well, but I, what he does say is he says, I will not apologize for being openly gay. Yes. And I will not apologize for being sex positive in a sex, sex negative positive. world. Well, what, I, you know, because I'm that smutty person. What was he doing? I want to know. I haven't seen the picture. I do. I, I want to see it, actually, because I think But he's here's hot. the <laughs> thing. You know, it, it's 2022, by God. And, I, you know, three-fourths of the World of Wonder employees have OnlyFans. And I just, you know, I mean, like, and if you've been on Grindr at three in the morning, you're going to see everybody you've ever met in Hollywood a year. I, so I don't know where the outrage is coming from because it is like the default setting for every homosexual is you can go on whatever site you want and do whatever you want. Now, that is the world that we live in. And if that's how you get your extra coins, then so be it. You know, there's nothing there is. He no also didn't do it for money. He didn't do it for money. He well, was just even if you don't, there is no reason to. You can't sex shame anybody. You can't slut shame anybody anymore. Well, clearly you can. Easy. Clearly you can. <laughs> it's, just, it's just upsetting. I, well, the, but there is a double standard because on NBC or CNN, I can't remember which one, and I'm not going to say the person's name. I don't know if you remember about 10 years ago, one of the reporters was caught in the rambles with a, a hook on his penis and he was methed out of his mind and he was masturbating and he got arrested. Does anyone it remember was that? CNN. It was CNN. It was that British reporter. Yeah, no, 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 no. Don't say his and name. It, don't say his and name. And it was Central Park. He had a rope around park. his penis that he was lifting up and down for people as they walked past. Well, you see, I like that bit. So that's why I want to know what the weatherman was doing. You're the one, Fenton, who told me after having done documentaries about behind the scenes of, of pornography and very intellectual pieces uh, inside Deep Throat. Mm. Fenton, when I first came here, he's like, Ugh, pornography, sex. It's just the same thing over and over again. It was like, it was it, like I was like, oh my God, I love everything. And just like, oh. It is the well, same no, thing, but, but honey, it's great. I like my mom, I <laughs> toast in the morning. It's the same thing every morning, but I love it. I like well, that. no, but but every once in a while you do come across a rope wrapped around a penis that you are you know jiggling as a as a puppet. I mean, like there are new things in in sex all the time. I've just discovered something last week that was um blew my mind, and I can't Tell remember me. what it was. I'll have to think <laughs> about it. it Kind of blown your mind very much, frankly. I, I hope uh, our weatherman Eric uh, bounces back. I just you know you said you were outraged, but it still exists. The sex shaming mm -hmm. still exists. Who's yeah. and it's, if anything. I'm also my 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 trainer said so I don't know if it's true but like it was it might have been a revenge porn kind of thing where like Probably. somebody um but like my God when you know everything we've been through with COVID and being locked up and la 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 I'm like like that's that's what that, that that's what where you're drawing the line. It, I do think he should come to L.A. because L.A. is famous for its Twinkie weathermen. Number three, James. Number three. I watched this morning, I got up at seven o'clock and I started watching uh, U.S. and the Holocaust, the Ken Burns documentary on PBS. And Ken Burns, of course, can do a six part series about doorknobs. And it's absolutely brilliant. And this is absolutely brilliant. There's no doubt about it. It is, it is absolutely transfixing. It is terrifying. It is upsetting. It is something that every American should see. Unfortunately, we are such a divided country that the people who should see it are not going to see it. So it's sort of preaching to the choir a little bit. It documents the rise, not only the rise of the Nazis in Germany, but also um, how America's complicity, 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 com com complicity or com compliance in so many ways. There was, um, you know, our own history of anti-Semitism and racism that was rising and rising and rising after World War One. It's sort of at the same time as Germany. Our immigration policies, which were then as they are now, as fucked up as anything as any country on the planet, and our isolationist policies at that time, as our policies during Trump, um, sort of mirror what's happening now, and it 
the failure to do anything about the rising threat and the, the students didn't want to do anything about it. And the government was anti-Semitic and it was old school, blah, blah, blah. And it's sort of everything that we see now. But the fact that even when we recognized what was happening in Germany, we did nothing to stop it. Even the Jews that were trying to escape um, Germany, we made it difficult for them to come in. They had to have a job. But if they had a job, they were taking away jobs from Americans. So if they didn't have a job, then they weren't going to wor work for America. So like it was sort of like no matter what you did, they were damned and they were told to go away. And the and part so I saw that was – I'm sorry. That was upsetting was the, the first wave of people who left like in 32, 33, the Jews, they were kind of accepted because there was – then it right. sort of – and, and then, then countries the, around them were like, too many, too many, too many. Yeah. You know, in the beginning, Belgium and, and everybody yeah. else was saying yes. And then they all started shutting down their borders until famously there was a ship of, of Jews who got who escaped, got to America, made it to Ellis Island and were turned away at Ellis Island. The ship went back and they were all slaughtered. You know, I mean, like thousands of people made it <sighs> to America. We turned them away. They went back and they all died. You know, um. So there's so much to digest here, and there's and it, I, I only saw the first episode. There's two more that they dropped this week, and it's it's so scary that so many things are like they are now, and so many things that I didn't even know that most of Hitler's ideas he got from America's treatment of Native Americans, the Aboriginal, you know, indigenous yes. people here, where we kept pushing them, pushing them, pushing them out of their, their homes and then rounding them up and then pushing them into. Camps. Also segregation in the South was another model. Yes, exactly. So all the, How so do you make people studying, less, than, less than. Yeah. He's he studying America and what we did in our manifest destiny. And that's what he got his ideas for, for Mein Kampf. And uh, in his idea for the final solution and everything was the way we were treating our, you know, our people. And so it's just, yeah, it's so. We always I, want, and I don't this is, this is too bold, too broad a thing to say, but we always want to put a like, we're not like that. They're like yeah, that, right? I'm but good we are. That. We're and, all, but the human race is complicit, you know, <clears> and the <throat> best of us and the worst of us, we're, we are one. And the evil comes from us as well as the good. It's the thing we have in us that we want to turn away and look away and not be involved in that. It's not our problem. It's not our problem until it is our problem. And that's what is happening, you know, under Trump and the rise of fascism. It's even the other thing that scares me about that thing was like, even the Jews in early, you know, Germany in the early 30s, like, is it time to go now? Like, will you know yes. when it's time to go? Like, like, you know, we have a business, we have this, we have this. Is it like, let's And, and they, were, they would all say, you know, that they realized on some level that it was going to get worse and they knew it was going to get worse, but they kept thinking, well, next month, next month until, yeah. yeah. And I think also as it got worse, there was a feeling that maybe disaster would be averted and Hitler would be killed mm -hmm. or he wouldn't, you know, that it just wouldn't get that, get that back. And there's the also, the, there's the, the frog in the, in the, in the yeah. boiling water thing they, where uh, as it gets, you, 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 you adjust yourself to each level of, of <laughs> terrible. But what I think is especially scarily relevant is the reluctance of people here to recognize that similarity between Trump and Hitler. And people think Trump no. is just a fool and he's an idiot and he doesn't it, exactly. pose and that. Exactly. And that's the, what they did he, think about. But yeah. he does. He does pose that threat precisely and, you know, because people don't take him seriously, which was precisely what people did do with Hitler. They didn't take him seriously. And, and they also said that it was the elites that put um, Hitler in power because they thought they could control him. And then right. once he got into power, they realized they couldn't. Right. Uh, the other weird thing the simul Ten Ken Burns' timing was extraordinary because last week was when we saw the rally in Youngstown, Ohio, where everyone started giving the one armed salute to yeah. Trump yeah. from the QAnon. Yeah. And the the images of that are absolutely terrifying. And then, you know, you hear things like, you know, Letitia James today suing the Trump family for $250 million. And people are saying, oh, no, that's a bad thing to do because it's just going to energize the QAnon Trump network and it's like well what the you it all energize you don't it's everything is yeah. exactly exactly there, there's no winning with that because no, exactly. no you you do. stand up to the bully well okay um that's ken burns what's, what's it called james u.s and the holocaust u.s and the holocaust on pbs and uh, yeah. yeah i'm gonna watch it i haven't watched it yet but funny enough number two number two sashin little feather so at the 1973 oscars um, Marlon Brando won for The Godfather. 
but he wouldn't accept the award. And instead, he sent um, Sashin Littlefeather to... She didn't accept the award, did she? She repudiated the award. Yes, as a political statement, he sent her in his place. Absolutely. And uh, The Hollywood Reporter wrote just the other day, an ugly stain of bigotry in Oscars history eventually led to a celebration of indigenous culture hosted at the heart of the motion picture industry nearly half a century later. So what I'm saying is, yes, the Academy has apologized over the years, but they held a big event um, last weekend um, honoring her and sort of continuing this work of apologizing. And our very good friend, Bird Running Water, interviewed her at the event on stage. Mm. And it was just, it was just, it was just, I didn't go and I, I could have gone, I guess, because it was open to the public, but I just read it and I thought, well, it's a little late, but thank goodness, you know, there is. Thank goodness she's still around to, to, to yeah. feel the love because it's been, it's been 50 years and she very well could not be around, you know, so. But she really paid a, a professional price for that. Um, yeah. Because she, you know, she, she was jeered and, you know. John Wayne looked like he was going to beat the crap out of her, if you recall. He was furious at the, mm. at the Academy Awards. Um, Marlon Brando also paid a price for it, too, you know. I don't think his career ever recovered. Right. Um, uh, my sister worked the event, the Sashin uh, tribute. Mm. It, um, she was uh, She's an event coordinator with Wolfgang Puck, who catered it. And uh, she had a... They, they were given a list. Everyone who worked there was given this list, and it's absolutely extraordinary. If I can just read a few things, um, that they are not allowed under any circumstances to touch any of the indigenous people. No, you, you are not allowed to touch them. You are not, when they go through the security, you cannot touch anything in their bags. They might have sacred objects with them, and you are not allowed to. You can open the bag, but you cannot put your hand inside of it. You could not touch anything they were wearing because it might be a sacred garment. You can't call it a costume. You can't touch any of the regalia. You are not allowed to speak to them. Uh, the the uh, the elders you are not allowed to speak to. And um, you, these are the waiters and everything like that. And the butlers for each people at the, at the during the dinner, um, uh, you have to serve all of the elders first before anybody else. So you cannot, nobody can get water. Nobody can get anything until the elders have had theirs. So it sort of, it sort of sounds a little bit like royalty, which is a nice thing to hear that we're treated, you know, that they are being treated as royals, but it sort of sounds a little bit like Buckingham Palace, doesn't it? A whole other culture. Yes, it does. A whole different way of doing things, which by the way, you know, Trump said um, that if he were invited to the uh, uh, funeral, he wouldn't have been sat in the 14th row. Well, A, bitch, you weren't invited. So how's that for starters? And secondly, they put members of the royal family from other countries in front of non-royal countries, countries that don't have monarchies, which, of course, I know is a whole other argument whether you should or should not have a monarchy. But in the UK, where we do have a monarchy and all the other heads of monarchy were invited, they sat in front of the American president. Well, so, it makes sense. Trump. I don't know why he exactly. twinges about sometimes. Don't give him air. I know, I know. I saw you close your eyes. When <clears> I, <throat> yeah. Chat. <laughs> <laughs> I love your cat sound of disapproval. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we'll do for the rest of the show. <laughs> uh, Drag Race Philippines airing now on new episodes on Wednesdays on wowpresentsplus.com. Oh, my gosh. And the first two seasons of Down Under are also available to stream. Down Under just crowned their queen, and it was a crowd favorite according to Twitter. I was I was sort of watching on Twitter, and people were really happy with the season and really pleased with the, the queen. So um, kudos to all them and all the people that work hard on that show, Down Under. Now, when we come back, we'll reveal the number one thing this week that made us go, Wow. wow. You're listening to World of Wonders Wow Report. Things that make us go wow. Welcome back to the Wow Report. It's Fenton here with James and Tom. We've been counting down the top 10 things that made us go wow, and we've reached number one. Number one. I'm going to let James tell you what it is, but I just want you to know that the, that for millions of people around the country and the world, the Wow Report is the number one place they get their medical advice and their health <laughs> advice. So James, who is our meteorologist, weatherman, uh, nutritionist, and 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 consumer reporter, 
All right. Break the story for us. I'm a trend reporter as well. My goodness, I, I spot these things. It's the new Tide Pod. If you are eating Tide Pods, you are no longer in. You are out. To get rid of your Tide Pods, we're moving on. The new big deal among uh, uh, connoisseurs of uh, strange street drugs is NyQuil chicken. Cook, sauteing your chicken in NyQuil. Do not eat. Do not cook NyQuil with your chicken. Keep going. Well, I said that. I said, you know, shoot, I was planning on having this tonight on Twitter. And I got a number of people who said, James, I think you'll be okay. This is for novices. Novices. No. Yeah. But I think that people like you, you've built up a, a tolerance. No. You will be able to have your NyQuil chicken. And then somebody else was calling it um, uh, robo, ro, ro, you know, like Robitussin and Robotisserie or something. Like there was I have a question. I, yeah. I, why? Why? I just don't understand what, like, what is the high you're supposed to get from? Like, well, it's, it's really not about getting high. What it is, okay. is there's a whole TikTok challenge thing that is putting the most disgusting things with the most disgusting things like chocolate sauce on, on green beans and onions. Or, I mean, like, you know, like you try and come up with the most disgusting thing that you can, and then you have to eat it. So they but, were, so this is what but we found doing. out that boiling, boiling medicines can, the vapors can kill you because they're concentrated and they can change the, you know, chemical composition yes. and it can actually yes. kill you. Although I have yes. to say, while you should never eat NyQuil with chicken, it sounds to me like a perfect cure for a cold. It's like, I put a little NyQuil in the chicken soup. It's, I feel bad. I'm like, <laughs> well, I remember when, what was the, um, the, you dropped the thing in the water and it was for colds. What was that? Emergency. Was emergency. 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 Yes. I always used to drink emergency and vodka at clubs. When I during cold season, I thought it would well, sort it was of great with a pork chop, emergency <laughs> pork chops. I was <laughs> but anyway, no, I was kidding before, and Tom is absolutely right that the problem with it is is that the minute you heat up these things, it turns deadly, and you can it should not uh, uh, under any circumstances inhale cooked NyQuil. Right, and that's so what you even have to say this is is ridiculous, but just stick to Tide Pods, right. Stick to your Tide Pods, kids. No, no, no. Thanks no, for tuning no. in to the Wow Report on Radio Andy Sirius XM. Listen to previous episodes on our YouTube channel, Wow Presents. And hopefully we'll see you same time, same place next week. Until then, go out and do something that makes the world go wow. wow.